After a while of TIG welding stainless steel, when I was first learning, I started to realize something. And when I realized it, it's one of the most insane observations I made, and I can't believe it took me so long to learn it. And more importantly, I can't believe nobody taught it to me. This is what I'm gonna teach you today. My name is Dusty, and I'm a welding artist from Vancouver Island, Canada. On my YouTube channel, it is my mission to teach and show off the possibilities of TIG welding. And I wanna show it to all the positive people in the welding industry who love TIG welding as much as I do. So, join me for my mission on my channel, and let's get welding. This is Pacific Arc TIG Welding. Hey Archeads, welcome to another episode. So, I teach a lot of people how to TIG weld. I've taught a lot of people in person, taught a lot of people on my online training program now. Now, I usually stick to teaching people mostly aluminum TIG welding, but it's always a real treat when I get to go over stainless steel with someone. The reason that I really like doing this is because of this. When I first began to start learning how to TIG weld stainless steel, there were a ton of variables that I didn't know how to deal with. I always struggled with getting welds that were gray and overheated and looked like trash. Even when I eventually started to get the hang of things, there were still a lot of variables where I didn't understand why things were turning out the way that they were. And then after a while, I started to realize something. And it was one of the most insane observations that I made, and I can't believe it took me so long to learn it. And more importantly, I can't believe nobody taught it to me. So when I'm teaching someone how to TIG weld stainless steel, as you can imagine, there's a ton of things that we're gonna watch out for. We obviously wanna watch out for overall shape, the profile of the weld, and how to get the best finish possible. But the one thing I find most important, as far as something that gives us immediate feedback, is the heat affected zone. Now, for those of you that may not know this already, the heat affected zone is the zone surrounding the weld area. This basically always turns out to be visual evidence of the base material being affected by the heat that we are putting into it. Now, obviously the heat can reach out much further than we can actually see with our eyes, but I found that looking at the visible evidence of this can be one of the most simple ways to break down your own work as you're going. So what we wanna avoid is something like this. Obviously we can tell that this is way too hot. This weld has basically collected an oxide on the surface. That's exactly what the gray stuff is on the surface of the weld, it's an oxide. So obviously we can look at that stuff, but what we actually wanna pay attention to is the area surrounding the weld. Take a look at how far it reaches out from the weld itself. Now compared to this photo here, do you see how in this photo we have a much tighter heat affected zone? What has happened here with this one is we have managed our heat much better. There's a couple different ways you can do this. I did an episode a few months ago where I talked about how to get the cleanest stainless steel TIG welds possible. But go back, check this one out. It will help you out a lot with understanding a few different things we need to do to get the cleanest TIG welds possible. But basically, the easiest way to describe what we are looking for is we want to be mitigating and reducing the overall heat input we put into the base material. When you prevent your base material from overly heating up, you give your weld a much better chance to be properly shielded by your gas. And when your weld is properly shielded by gas, it won't form an oxide, it'll have a better finish, and overall the heat input will be much less. When things have gone way too far, as far as temperature goes, you can have as much gas coverage going over your weld area and it won't do a damn thing. When your base material has heated up too much, even the nicest gear you can buy will not stop you from forming this oxide. Now, this may seem counterintuitive, but one of the ways I help people get over this problem is to actually not worry about overheating as much. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Let me explain. What we're gonna do is follow one of my rules that I call fill and chill. And it's all gonna happen at the start of the weld. We are gonna add more filler at the start of the weld and wait for things to fully blend and take the shape that we need to. So fill and chill. By adding a little bit of extra filler at the start, this way we can afford to hang out a little bit longer simply because we are gonna be heating up filler material and not base material as much. And because you're able to hang out a little longer at the start, we are gonna establish a proper profile. And once we have established that profile and the size and shape we need, we can now move out. And here's the thing, now we can travel a little bit faster. So let me demonstrate what I mean here and I'll rip a quick demo for you. I've got this 1.6 millimeter or 1 16th of an inch 304 stainless steel tacked up into a corner joint. Once I get the Everlast machine going here, I want you to watch the start. The start is the most important part Look at how long I take to fully establish everything before I start moving. Once everything is sat down nicely, I can get ripping at a quicker travel speed. So we've done two things here. The first is to put less heat into the base material. 
Because we added a little bit of extra filler at the start, we're gonna be heating up a little more filler than base material itself. So the second thing, now that we have a proper start and shape, as I said, we can now travel at a faster travel speed. So overall, we will be putting much less heat into the plate, and this will mitigate the overall heat input. At this point, when things aren't screaming hot, the gear you are using will have a much easier time of doing the job it needs to. You can actually achieve really clean stuff using some of the most basic gear. It's all about how you set up for your weld. As I said earlier, you can have the fanciest gear, the best gas flow situation, but if you're overheating your stuff, it's gonna turn out oxidized and looking a bit trash. Now, I know everybody out there has probably got some sweet gear on their torch. Actually, as a matter of fact, tell me below in the comments what you're using for a torch setup, what gas screens, what cups, all that stuff. I always love seeing what people use and what kind of success they have using it. Everybody knows what I use. I use edge welding cups. These welding cups are dope. They're very simple. They just go over an existing gas lens, pretty straightforward stuff, but they give great coverage and I really enjoy using them. I'll put a link to them in the description below. But anyway, what I was saying, all about the fundamentals that I've talked about here, making sure everything is set up to run smoothly and clean so that when using proper technique, our gear has a much easier time of doing the job it needs to, and we end up with stuff that's nice and shiny. So again, I'll put a link in the description below to this episode here. If you wanna take a deeper dive on that subject, check the description below, check that one out. Again, check the description below for links to all of the gear I use. Go out today and do a random act of kindness for a stranger. It's the only thing I ask for in return for anything you may have learned here. Spread some positivity in the world today, we need it. For Pacific Arctic Welding, Phil and Chill, my name is Dusty, have a good one, peace.